Hello, my name is Will Butler and I am the Head of Military Records at the National Archives and I am going to briefly take you through the records we hold which relate to Army service during the First World War. Most of the records I am going to talk about today are available to view and download online either directly through our website or through our partner websites, principally places like Ancestry and Find My Past. To begin with, I wanted to briefly talk about deciding whether an individual you were researching was either an officer or a soldier. A soldier was often known as in the other ranks. This is important especially for personnel and service records, because depending on whether someone was an officer or a soldier, the records are kept in different places. They are in different series. Ideally, it would also be useful to have to hand some information about the individual you are researching. Obviously, things like a name are crucial, but it may also be handy to know at least an approximate year of birth, possibly even a place of birth too. If you know that they were given a service number of some description, then that can certainly help narrow down your research, as would knowing, in the case of the army, for example, which regiment or branch of the service in which someone served. It's not essential to have all of this information. After all, some of it you may be trying to find out in the process of your research, but some additional details can aid in your search. Let's start with First World War Other Ranks. The main collection of our Other Ranks service records are contained in the W0363 series, and these are known as the Burnt Documents. They are name searchable and downloadable, particularly from ancestry.co.uk, and if you are at queue, they are free to access and download on site. However, it's worth bearing in mind that only about a third of these documents survive. Unfortunately, the rest were destroyed during the Blitz in 1940, hence why they're known as the Burnt Documents. You can find more information about these records and how to search them in our research guide to British Army soldiers after 1913. If you're lucky enough to find that the person you're looking for has a surviving service record, then they can be a real wealth of information. They often contain things like attestation papers, which can include information such as place of birth, age, trade, and things like next of kin, so quite often either the soldier would put down their parents' details or indeed their wife's details. These records might also include a service history, which would include things like postings, so where they were stationed, and where they went throughout the war, the regiments in which they served, and any promotions that they might have obtained throughout the war as well. Sometimes they also contain a medical history, and occasionally information about their conduct and discipline. The image here is the front page of an attestation form. It's a straightforward form to understand and interpret, and provides a wealth of information should you be lucky enough to have that information there. Additionally, held separately, there are service records of the Household Cavalry, which are available in the W0400 series, and include 8,000 records relating to the First World War. These are searchable by name and downloadable directly from the National Archives website and differ very little from other service records of the period. In the W0364 series, you can also find other ranks pension records. Again, these are name searchable through our partner websites and contain similar information to a service record. The main difference being that the pension records should provide information relating to a cause of discharge, so also a reason for a pension. This example states that the individual was wounded in the left arm. He had an operation performed in Belfast and the note states, amongst other things, that he has much stiffness in the fingers and that the blood supply appears very deficient. As you can see, you can find some very specific details in these records. An important element to note about the records in the three series I've just mentioned is that they only cover service for those discharged from the army before 1920. Many soldiers who had served in the First World War remained in the army beyond this date, and until recently their records were still held by the Ministry of Defence. The records are currently not available on our catalogue, but the service records relating to those who were discharged before 1939, as well as a small selection of Second World War service records, are currently being digitised by Ancestry and will be available in the near future. More information about the transfer, including frequently asked questions, is available on our website. And please do keep an eye out for announcements and updates by the National Archives and Ancestry about the release of the digitised records. Now let's turn to service records of officers in the British Army. 
These are some of the most popular records in our collection and unfortunately have not been digitized and so are not available online. They are, however, searchable by name on our catalogue and their size can range from a few pages to a few volumes, partly depending on the amount of correspondence generated during and after their service. The largest collection can be found in the W0339 series, but some records can also be found in W0374 and W0138. As you can see here, the records contain personal information about an individual. This particular record is for the author and playwright J.B. Priestley, and includes various other forms and correspondence. As he was commissioned as an officer from the ranks, the record also includes his original attestation form, similar to those found in W0363. And this final example from an officer's point of view is taken from the W0138 series, which is essentially a series of notable military personnel. Principally, this includes high-ranking officers, but also famous individuals too. This example is that of the poet Wilfred Owen, and what's particularly interesting here, and especially relating to his military experiences, is that it includes the proceedings of his medical board from 1917. For both officers and other ranks, there are other records you might explore, especially if you've been unable to locate a service record for the person you are researching. In particular, the National Archives holds the British Army Medal Index cards for the First World War period. These can be found in the W0372 series and are available to download from the National Archives website. They are searchable by name, regimental number, corps, and or rank. You can utilize a mixture of these search terms to try and narrow down who you are looking for. This is particularly useful if you are searching for someone with a common name. These records are not as detailed as a service record, but can provide additional information if the service record has not survived. For example, they will often contain the first theatre of war in which someone served, and when they entered that theatre. Quite often, if this is blank, it means that the individual went to France in 1916 or later. The original medal issue and medal receipt may also be noted. However, most of the cards record medal entitlement rather than the awarding of medals. If you want to check whether a person received a medal, you can consult the medal rolls in W0329 which should be annotated with pencil ticks if they actually receive their medals. The index cards do also come in slightly different formats and often use codes which can be difficult to understand. We have a research guide specifically relating to these cards, which contains information about how to interpret some of this information. It also includes details about the medals issued during the First World War and why certain medals were awarded, so you can start to get to grips with what is written on these index cards. And, as I say, they can provide some useful additional information for you to carry out your research, particularly if a service record doesn't survive for the person that you're looking for. The National Archives also holds many thousands of operational records relating to the planning and conduct of battles and campaigns. When researching individuals or specific units, it's also possible to find information in these operational records. Principally, we hold a large collection of unit war diaries for the First World War. The completion of these diaries was a requirement for individual units at regiment, brigade, division and corps level and can provide detailed insights into battles and campaigns and the day-to-day -day movements and running of a unit. The majority of these diaries can be found in the W095 series and those which relate to operations on the Western Front are available from our website. Those which relate to other theatres of war are either available to view in our reading rooms or have been digitised by Ancestry. It is possible to search the catalogue using the name of the unit as the search term. They are listed in the catalogue by the unit, along with a short description summarising the theatre of operation and the section of the British Army command structure within which the unit existed, and this was usually at division. As I already mentioned, these diaries are a great way to find out what a unit was doing at any given time. It is important to remember, however, that they do not always contain details about individuals, especially if they weren't officers, but can contain information not found in other records. For example, to look at the unit in which J.B. Priestley served, it's possible to find the entry for the date in which he was injured. He was buried when a shell exploded nearby on the 13th of June 1916. The diary entry records that, quote, in the afternoon the enemy sent over a few heavy shells and he obtained a direct hit on one of the dugouts which was occupied by the battalion bombers. 
The result was two men killed, one man wounded, and four admitted to hospital, suffering from shell shock. And we know from his service record that Priestley was one of those sent to hospital on this date. The diaries can also contain some of the more unusual and lighter-hearted activities which took place away from the front line. I was recently researching an individual who was in the 15th, 17th West Yorkshire Regiment, and I knew that he'd been injured during the German Spring Offensives in March 1918. As it turned out, the battalion had taken part in what was the 93rd Infantry Brigade Inter-Platoon Competition in January 1918, and this competition, which was held between about 500 other infantry platoons, was won by Number 4 Platoon A Company of that battalion of the West Yorkshire Regiment. And it just so happens that the person I was researching was a member of that platoon. There was a nominal role for the team and it gave the name of the individual I was looking for, as well as the other individuals within that platoon. There are a few other record series which I think are worth mentioning here too. The National Archives also holds campaign medal roles which can be searched on Ancestry by name, regimental number and regiment, and we also hold the roles of the Silver War Badge which was awarded to those military personnel who were discharged as a result of sickness or wounds contracted or received during the war, whether they served at home or overseas. Announcements for the award of gallantry medals and honours can be searched in the London Gazette through its website. If you know that someone had obtained a gallantry award, you can search for their citation, so essentially when they were awarded that medal. And the National Archives also holds selected military medical records for the period from 1912 up until 1921, which includes some hospital admission and discharge records. Unfortunately, there is no comprehensive list which covers all prisoners of war taken during the period, and the surviving documents cover only a fraction of those who were captured. There are, however, around about 3,000 interviews and reports concerning British prisoners of war, which are available in the WO161 series, and again, these are available to download from our website. If the person you are researching was subject to a court's martial for a disciplinary offence, then the National Archives also holds a range of these records. A service record may detail these kinds of offences, and it may be possible to find out slightly more information. Registers of these offences can be found in WO213, while those committed at home and abroad can also be found in WO92 and WO90, respectively. Alongside details about the individual concerned, these registers usually contain information such as the date an offence was committed, where it took place, what the offence actually was, and what sentence was handed out. We also hold a selection of papers and proceedings of trials, which tend to contain much more detail, and you can find out more information about locating these records in our Research Guide to British Army Courts Martial Records. Finally, though not available through the National Archives, I wanted to draw your attention to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, which holds an online database of men and women killed during the First World War, as well as a significant database relating to the Second World War. Again, this is name searchable and can provide useful additional information not initially available from the National Archives. Entries often contain information about an individual, so the date of their death, sometimes you get an address, you sometimes get names of spouses or parents as well. This information can quite often provide you with help when searching records at the National Archives. Often it is possible to find slightly more information, perhaps more than you already knew. This means that you can then use that information to further enhance your searches of our collections. And the Commonwealth War Graves Commission have also digitised several documents which are available to download as well, particularly about grave registration and the concentration of graves, which you may also find useful. These records also often contain things like the addresses for next of kin, and again, you can use all of that information to help you search our records as well. That concludes this brief summary of First World War Army records. Hopefully, I've been able to provide you with some guidance to help in your research of this topic. There are, of course, many other records which may be of interest, which I haven't covered here. To find out more, do remember that we have an array of research guides available on our website, which go through some of those additional records, while also providing information about how to search for the records we have spoken about today. Thank you, and good luck with your research.